In today's video, we're going to learn the classic tune, The High Road to Gerlach. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody, I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and on this channel I make videos to make you a stronger and more confident piper. If you like this kind of content, please think about liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and hitting that bell icon to get notified of all of my new videos. I also give Skype lessons if you want more personalized instruction, but more on that later. In the description below, there's a link to the PDF document we have right here, so go ahead, print that out, put it on a tablet, have it in front of you so you can follow along. Ah, the High Road to Gerlach. We've been using this tune quite a lot in this basic series here, and for good reason. It's a great melody, and it can help us really build some of the skills we need to learn not just this tune, but other tunes. The first time we ran into this tune, and there'll be a card here to the video, was using it to master basic rhythms in bagpipe music. And what I mean by that is a round rhythm where when we subdivide a note into two, they're both even, a pointed rhythm where the first note is longer than the second, and a snapped rhythm where the first note is shorter than the second. Then we reapproached the tune when we learned how to change notes with grace notes, especially ones with crosses, and the video for that will be linked up here right now. And that one has some simple grace note changes in the melody structured like it is here. The difference, the grace notes in that were just by themselves. This version, as you can see, is, well, quite a bit more complicated. But as you're looking at this right here, you can see there's a number of embellishments. And the first one we're going to run into is the C doubling right here. And the doublings were covered in another video. So again, I'm going to link right up here to a card talking about my video on doubling so you can get those under control. And then if we just keep looking across the page, the next grouping of grace notes we see together are in the form of a D throw. And for today, specifically the light D throw. And again, I just recently made a video on the light D throw, so you should check that out up there. I'm going to go over all of the different things in these individual videos. Today, we're not going to be really breaking those down since they were broken up before. So really check those out. Make sure you have those under control before trying to tackle this tune. Now, a few things I like doing when I first get a tune, especially if it's one I'm not very familiar with, is I like to use a variety of highlighters and a pencil. So the highlighters we're going to need today are the neon, kind of yellow, orange, pink. And what are we going to do with these? I like to go through, and the first thing I like to do is use the neon colored one to go through and mark all of the G grace notes in the tune. And I mark just the grace note itself, including the grace note in the doubling. Now, in this particular tune, all of the high G grace notes are all the neon colored ones because they're all below an F. I want to point this out because if we were on a tune that had two high A's with a G grace note between them, that would not be this color. I would actually use a blue highlighter for that because that is a sweeping motion. It is not a lifting grace note. It's a different type of grace note. So... Just be aware that don't just go through randomly. Make sure that the neon color ones you're marking are for lifting G grace notes and not tapping or sweeping high G grace notes. Next, I'm going to go through and use the orange to mark all of the lifting D grace notes. The first one we run into is actually in the C doubling itself. So I've marked the first G grace note with the neon color. I'm not going to mark the C at all because that C actually isn't a grace note. It's a real note written like a grace note. I again call these sounding tones because we actually hear them when we're playing the music. The individual grace notes like the G and the D, not so much. And if you learn how to associate your grace notes with these colors, and I always use these colors for these grace notes, what's great is it's a different part of your brain that like sees color versus placement and shape. So when you run into grace notes in the wild and perhaps they're in a pattern you're not familiar with or you're playing the wrong grace note, if you have learned to associate them with a color, you can just kind of color in that grace note and boom, for the most part, your brain is going to kind of automatically fix it for you. And that's pretty cool. So in the D throw, there's a D in that, but we're not going to mark it because as I said in my light D throw video, there are no actual grace notes in the light D throw. It is three sounding tones. So we're going to just leave that one as it is. So the next D grace note we come across is in the B doubling. All of the D grace notes in this particular tune are in the doublings themselves. And this tune has C and B doublings. 
Now we're going to move on to pink for the E grace notes. And this tune has a number of E grace notes, which makes it a little different. They're not the most common of the primary grace notes. So this is a great tune to start learning how to, well, get them under control and well practiced. Every time you have a doubling going down in this particular tune, you're going to be going down to the next note with an E grace note. If that kind of stuff helps you remember stuff, and I know it does for me, it's something to just kind of keep in mind as you're playing this. At the end of the lines, we can see there's a low G grace note. We are not going to color that in because again, in the low G catch video, which again, marked up here if you haven't watched that yet, you'll know again, that's a sounding tone that is not a grace note. We write it like a grace note because it's kind of serving the purpose. It's kind of adding accent to the note, but it's not played like a grace note. It's an actual real low G between, in this case, a B and a low A. All right, and then finally, before we even start playing, I'm gonna mark one more thing, and that is the phrases. Now, in most pipe music, Phrases are two bars, but they're not always strictly two bars. You can have pickup notes or notes that come before the beat, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. In this tune, it's actually very straightforward and the phrases really are just two bars each. So I'm gonna go ahead and write in parentheses at the top and of bar one and at the end of bar two. And by doing that, I can see that I have a bite-sized chunk of music. A musical phrase is kind of the smallest amount of music that kind of makes sense on its own in the melody. So it's like a sentence of a sort in music. Then I'm gonna put another parentheses at the top of bar three and at the end of bar four for the next phrase. And in this case, this phrase is kind of an answer to the first phrase. So the first phrase is more of a question. And the next phrase, kind of an answer, but not the final answer. Then we go into line two, and we're going to mark it the same way. And in this tune, this phrase happens to be the same as the phrase above it. It's often similar. It can be the same. It can be completely different. It really depends on the melody. But in this one, it's exactly the same. Ba, ba, da, bum, da, da, bum, ba. And then the final answer. Bum, ba, da, da, dum, da, da, ba, da. I'm going to go ahead and keep marking this up. Again, you'll see on screen what I'm doing right now. And yeah, it's making the music a little ugly, but, you know, we're not going to be reading this in front of a music stand for very long. We need to get these memorized. And if these tips will help you get them memorized to help get your grace notes accurate and the proper phrasing in the tune, well then, cool. So the tune here is all marked up, ready to go. We're ready to start tackling the first of our melodies. And we can see we're starting off with a pointed rhythm. We're going to be holding that E for three quarters of the beat, going to an F for a quarter of the beat, and then using a G grace note to go back down to the E. For teaching the tune in this video, I am not using my extended or basic counting methods while talking about the timing of this tune. There are several reasons for it. One, not everyone comes into this needing help with timing, and if you do, I have specific videos that can help you with your timing, and you should definitely check those out. There will be a link in the description as well as a card above. But it would also make this video very long, at least 40 minutes, and maybe even getting close to an hour if we were counting all of that with it. So if you need help with your timing, that's totally cool. Again, there's links in the description to videos on timing. So check those out and apply them to this and that will help you along. I just wanted to address why that is not part of this video right now. Also starting with a G grace note. And again, just to start with the grace note, you're gonna be on whatever note is shown with that grace note in the air. So in this case, we're on an E, grace note in the air. As soon as you start blowing into the channel, lower that finger, you'll hear like a ch down to the note, and that will be the emphasis that we're gonna to need to kind of start that melody. And making sure again, when you're going from the G grace note back down to the E, that we're not racing this guy back down. We want one up, both down, nice and clean, but keep those grace notes nice and small, nice and short. We don't want big, scoopy grace notes. We want crisp, small grace notes. And they're small simply because I'm not lifting my finger very high not because they're really tight and I'm squeezing my hand. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a small amount of tension in your hand or you're not gonna get a very crispy sounding grace note, but it's like a three on a scale of one to 10, not a 10. We're not trying to crush this thing. And then easily enough, once you're on E to go to the A, we're just lowering one finger because of the position of your bottom hand. So make sure your hand is in the proper position when you're playing these top hand notes. While I do have a metronome ready and we will be using it before the end of the day, I don't tend to use it the very first thing. I try to use an approximate rhythm. And what I mean by that is I can see that that E is a dotted E, so it's gonna be a little longer. And I can see the F is going to be a little shorter because it has 
two flags, it's a 16th note. So I want a long note to a short note to two medium-ish notes. That approximate rhythm for now is all I feel we need as we're starting to get the tune under our fingers. I'd play that bar several times until it's nice and clean. Your grace notes are nice and small. And again, making sure we're not on that F to E going. You can typically hear that and it can make your grace note not quite as clear as it should be. So now we're going to go from that low A to the C doubling starting bar too. And just briefly from there, we're going to go up with a G grace note from A to C and then separate it with a D. Again, check out the doublings video if you need review on how to play these correctly. Again, no twiddles, not. We ta ta. That's what we're looking for. Then we have an E grace note from there taking us down to low A, and then a G grace note taking us up to an E. And when we're doing that G grace note from low A to E, don't lift your whole hand. Make sure that middle finger stays down. I goofily call this the conservation of finger energy principle. Why do I call it that? Well, if you don't have to move a finger, don't move that finger. And in this case, you don't have to move that finger. Final. I'm going to start on that final low A of bar one, making that switch into bar two. And you're welcome to play it slower. Now let's put that whole phrase together. Play that several times, get it nice, clean, accurate. Make sure your grace notes are coming out properly, that you're not mixing any of them up. And if you can, and really, you have a smartphone, you're watching YouTube, I know you do. Record yourself, at least in audio, but if you have a video, that's even better. Record yourself and then wait a few minutes, go back, check it, listen to it. Did your version sound like my version? And if not, identify why it didn't. At the end of the day, you're your own best teacher. You're gonna be listening to yourself more than any instructor may ever be listening to you. So if you can get used to analyzing your own playing, listening back to it and being very critical of your playing, you'll move a lot faster moving forward. Now, we know a quarter of the tune just by doing that because this first phrase is also, as I said, the start of line two. Now, for most folks, this second phrase is the trickiest one in the whole tune. There are three D throws in this, and the second one is rather tricky. It's coming off a 16th note E. So we're gonna take this phrase a little bit more slowly, make sure we get everything in there. And then yes, that is a D throw at the end of the line because we're coming from a low G, so we're not gonna write in another low G to play that one. So for this, we're gonna start just right on the low G of that D throw. And again, we're playing just light D throws. If you already know a heavy D throw and it's going well for you, you're welcome to throw that in, but that's beyond the scope of this video today. We're gonna be doing light ones. So we're gonna do a light D throw, obviously to a D. And then we're gonna be doing the G grace note change to F. Now this is one of the trickier grace note changes. This grace note change, briefly again, from this position, you're gonna to have to lift your top hand, all three of them, and then lower down to an F while lifting your pinky. There's a bit of a switch on this one, and there has to be, because if you went from a D to an F, and then also lifted your G, well, you couldn't hold the channel because you only have your thumbs on it. So there has to be a bit of a switch on this one. So that note change can be a little tricky. Practice it a few times before maybe throwing it into the tune here. Then we're gonna walk down to an E and then another D throw. And remember, the low G of the D throw is coming from the note before. So in this case, that's that E and it's already a 16th note E, not very long. So. It's gonna kind of be F, short E, down to low G into that D throw. And starting with the first D throw. Throw, short, short throw. That's gonna be worth practicing again and again because we want this tune eventually to be quite lively and quick, though we're not in a hurry to get there. Keep it clean. Now we're on D, E grace note down, the pink's telling us that right there, E grace note down to low G, and then up to a B doubling. That's a nice little exercise to just run right there, just those three notes with the throw, E grace note to low G, and the B doubling. You're on the B, after that doubling, E grace note down to low G, and this time we're gonna hold it right to the beat, 
and then we're going to go up to the D throw, and this time it'll just be a D, C, D, because we're already on a low G. To put that whole phrase together. Practice that phrase a lot. This is the tricky phrase. This is the one that throws most people for a loop. Those two 16th notes make it very interesting, very exciting, but somewhat more challenging. So keep that in mind. We've already done the next phrase. So now we're moving on to the third unique phrase in the tune, the fourth overall phrase in the tune, and that is the cast off or the repeated ending. I was told that the cast off is when the end of a tune kind of repeats through the whole tune. Most tunes have something resembling a cast off. It might be the entire last phrase. It might just be the last bar of that phrase, but it's kind of the repeated ending. That's at least how it was described to me. So to play this cast off phrase, G grace note to A, dotted, so it's a little bit longer, up to B, and then to C doubling. So now we're doing the C doubling from a B. We had done it from an A previously. Now, again, you should have your doublings under control before diving into this tune. If you're struggling with your doublings, go back to that doubling video, play those exercises, get them under control under your fingers, at least the C and B, because I want you worrying more about making music here than just the technical stuff. If you can go into a tune already having kind of the technical ability to do things, you can make music a lot faster. So now A to B doubling on a quarter note, nice long note, and then a low G catch to that A. To put everything in this final phrase together, And like I was saying about cast-offs, the end of the tune is the same phrase as this one. So now we've actually learned more than half of this melody already. I think that's really cool. The fact that music repeats itself is one of the things that keeps our brain engaged. We like recognizing patterns, and musical patterns are, well, some of the ones that I certainly enjoy most. So before we move on to the next part, I have the metronome here set at 82, so I'm going to be counting the eighth note, not the quarter note right now. So that means each bar is actually going to have four beats. You're going to have the downbeat, the upbeat, the downbeat, and the upbeat, and you're gonna hear all of them on this. I've made the downbeat an accented sound and the upbeat a less accented sound. You can kind of imagine if you were tapping your foot, and you should be tapping your foot, that it's like your foot's in a box and it's making a sound both when it's tapping on the ground and when your foot's at the zenith, at its highest point. So with that in mind, it means the first note, that E, is going to be a beat and a half with this. The next F is going to be half of a beat, and then the E and the A will each be one beat each. That'll remain true for the next ones, though we do have to get that doubling in there, but you'll hear how it all goes together. And then finally, those quarter notes right now, because we're subdividing, are going to be two beats long. And you want your G grace notes and E grace note, in this case, to be right on the beat. The grace note and the metronome should be like one and the same. When that thing chirps, your finger should be chirping on the channer. It shouldn't be before or after, and it should be right about the length of time that these clicks are. The next phrase, when playing with metronome, a little bit trickier because of those D throws. You're going to be getting to the D in the middle of the throw on the beat. So it means you have to start that low G before the beat. It sounds complicated. That's kind of where everyone naturally wants to put them, so it's not so bad. And if 82 is too fast, bring it down. If you're not ready for the metronome yet, don't use it yet. Metronome's super useful. I highly recommend them. I make my students play with them. But there's a time and a place for everything. If you're still getting this under your fingers and the metronome is causing you to play messily and not well, then don't use it. Keep working out your finger work so that you have that. And then when you're ready, apply the metronome and get that beat nice, strong, and solid. Let's try all of line two now with this. So there's the first part of the High Road to Gerlach. Moving on. All right, we're moving on to the second part of High Road to Gerlach now. And this one is, it's challenging for different reasons. The first three phrases each have their 
respective embellishment happening three times. So that first phrase of line three has three C doublings. The second phrase, which again, a phrase is a two bar to measure section of music. That second phrase has three D throws. And then we go to the first phrase of line four, and it's got, again, three C doublings. When you have multiple occurrences of an embellishment, especially three of them like this, it really is important that they all sound the same. You don't want one doubling to be open, one doubling to be crushed, and one to be somewhere in the middle. You want all three of them the same. So we're starting right on that C doubling, and remember the G grace note of the doubling is what's on the beat. The D grace note will happen after. Then another E grace note to A. We already did that particular note change here. Then we're separating that low A with a G grace note, and this one is a dotted note. So again, we're going to hold it longer, even before the metronome is involved. We'll da 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 hold. Then we have a short B walking us up to a C doubling, another E grace note down to an A, and then up to another C doubling. Let's go ahead and give it a try. And remember, that that not Record yourself. Listen back. If they sound like that, it means your grace notes are probably both too big and overlapping each other. You've got to hear the note between them. In this case, the C. C, 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 A, A, B, C, C, A, C, C. The second phrase of line three, we have a D throw that's held to a short C, a G grace note to a B that's held, and this is probably the note that's missed the most. I would say roughly half of all of my students tend to not hold that note. They want to make this B and the next C even, and they're not. So hold that B. Oh, ba -da -da, da -do -da. And then we have another D throw right there. I also want to take a moment to point out why G grace notes sometimes, why E grace notes some other times. Well, in many, many tunes, it's kind of a convention that the G grace note represents the downbeat. So if we look, we can see that the G grace notes are all on the downs. And how can you tell it's a downbeat? Well, one of the ways is by the beams of the notes themselves. If you see notes beam together, so that's when the flags of the individual notes kind of come together to form a beam rather than a flag. You can see that in the first line where you have, well, there's a bunch of them. If we look at bar four, however, we can see that the downbeat is on that high G grace note on the doubling. So that's the downbeat. So that's kind of neat. Knowing how it's beamed, you can visually see the beats. We look at that beat one, beat two, beat one, beat two, beat one, beat two, beat one, beat two. The E grace notes, on the other hand, they're often used to emphasize the upbeat. If you look, all of the E grace notes in here are in the middle of those beamed sections. With us subdividing the beat right now, the G grace notes and the E grace notes are landing on the beat. But when we speed this up and start just counting those quarter notes, you'll hear that the E grace notes are taking place in the middle of the beat rather than on the beat itself. I did want to point out briefly, we do have a G grace note on the upbeat looking again at bar three of line one. That's because you can't play an E grace note to that F and whoever arranged this decided that they really wanted some emphasis on that F and I agree, it's a great place for that grace note. Let's go ahead and try that second phrase of line three. I think one of the reasons folks don't want to hold that B is because that short C is going to be shortened even more because of that D throw. Again, the low G of the D throw going to be taking its time away from that C. So rather than it being an actual 16th note, which is already a short note, it's going to be even a bit shorter than that to make time for that low G. But play it correctly. Hold that B. So line four has a phrase very similar to the one above it, but not quite the same. It starts with the same first bar, but in the second bar goes up with a C doubling, E grace note to a B rather than an A, then a C doubling, and then from there, instead of the C doubling being a quarter note, we're going to go up to an E. And that's a very exciting bit of music right there. I love that it goes to the B. You're probably going to want to go to an A at first, but don't do it. Go to the B as it's written. It sounds great. And then finally, the cast off is the same as, well, it has been. It's the same one as in line one. So now I'm going to go ahead at 82. And that, again, is a subdivided beat. We're going to try all of part two.
We do want to get it on a metronome, as I said, but don't rush into it. Make sure it's good, clean, accurate. Your embellishments are sounding like they should. You've listened back to a recording of yourself to really double check and make sure everything's right. When that's feeling good, add that metronome, find a speed that works for you, and give it a go. Now, each part has repeat signs. So if you're playing this whole tune as intended, you would play line one and two, and then repeat line one and two. So that's the dual bars with the dual dots. Those are repeat signs. We're gonna do that for both sections of this tune. The repeats aren't optional, people. Play them. When you can play the whole tune at whatever speed you're at, then eventually you're gonna wanna up the tempo. This is a parade style 2-4 march and is typically played anywhere from 85 to 95 or even 100 beats per minute so you can get your band down the, the road while you're in a parade. But don't rush into playing it quickly before you're ready. In the original video, I had myself playing High Road to Garlock subdivided at 82, meaning the eighth note getting the beat, as well as full speed at 82 with the quarter note getting the beat. That said, uh, when this was first uploaded, it was demonetized. The company, The Orchard Music, seems to think they have copyright claim to Hyrule de Garlock, which they cannot have. It's an old tune. It's one of the oldest tunes in Scotland or Western Europe, so it's not possible. But you can't really fight things like that on YouTube. So that being said, down below in the description, there are links to MP3s of those playthroughs. So again, it will be on the practice channel at 82, subdivided with the... 8th note getting the beat, as well as 82 with the quarter note getting the beat. So if you wanted to play along with those, they are available for you down below. But I couldn't include them in this video. Thought I'd let you know why. So there you go. The High Road to Gerlach starting to apply so many of the things that we've been building up to in this series. So I'm excited to hear how this works for you. So please comment below with how your High Road to Gerlach is going for you and if you found this video useful. Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you got something out of the video, please think about liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and sharing with any other pipers you think might get something out of this. If you want more personalized instruction, I do give Skype and online lessons. Go ahead and head over to www.mattpiper.com or email me at the address you see here, and we'll get you going. I'm working with folks from all over the planet, and I hope to work with you soon. If you want to go the extra mile, I also have a Patreon where as little as a dollar a month goes a really long way to help support the channel. You'll see some names scrolling. I think they're actually scrolling up. I think I normally say down. But in any case, these fine folks contribute monthly to help support the channel. Add your name to this list. Go ahead, head over there. There are some unique tier level gifts that, um, well, they're just fun and cool. So check it out. I also have some Command Your Bagpipe merchandise. If you want some bagpipe swag, I mean, come on. A bagpipe on a water bottle is pretty cool. But there's shirts and hats and all sorts of things, stickers. So head over there. There's a link down in the description below to my merch store. So check out and let the world know that you command your bagpipe. All right, everybody. I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.